Hey, it's Joel Walsman, CEO and Master Electrician of Jefferson Electric, one of the single biggest, most common, and very most important questions that we get asked at Jefferson Electric is, what about GFCI protection? And there are some confusions that I want to clear up, and there are some code applications that are very little known that I want to bring to light. So let me walk you through GFCI protection in its totality as it relates to dwellings. So here, at this receptacle outlet in my 1938 home, we've lost the ground. And I'm gonna show you how to restore that ground with a GFCI in a code compliant manner. And then we're gonna also talk through the other applications and common locations that you find GFCI protection. The tools we use for this project are really basic. We've got something to manipulate, manipulate your wires with. I like this needle nose wire stripper all in one from Milwaukee. Small flashlight, this is the Olo baton. Some type of wiring connector like the ideal wire nut or the Wago lever nut. Roll of electrical tape might be handy. A plug-in tester, GFCI of choice. A number one square drive, which is almost universally situated for electrical devices and a small flathead for securing your electrical plate. All of these will be listed in the description below. First, you wanna make sure the breaker is de-energized, and I've used my Klein Tools plug-in tester to do just that. Number one square drive, pops the screws out really nicely. Better traction than a Phillips. When, whoo, look at that, mm-mm-mm. Wire's too short now. That just broke right off. And look at that, that's an updated wiring method. It's three conductor and the ground is at the back and it's been improperly connected to the box instead of the device. However, the ground connection is no longer there. So let's see what we can do. And it's an undersized ground. Boo. So I'm gonna show you how to repair and extend this wire. Recognize the wire gauge, which in this case is 12, it's quite common, 12 or 14 to receptacle outlets. Use your 12 strip hole and gently pull it straight off. <clears throat> Whew. That conductor, there it is. And make sure it's free of insulation. You've got two common methods for pigtailing wires in a junction box the ideal wing nut, and the 221 Wago lever nut. I'm gonna use the Wago lever nut. I'm gonna be extending a black conductor. So I'm using the same size of conductor and the same color of conductor to maintain clarity and consistency. As we saw, we have a very short black conductor in the box. The code requires the wire to extend three inches from the face of the box. So we're gonna repair and extend the wire we can do it with a wire nut or with a 221 Wago lever. So what I'm gonna do is insert my stripped end of black 12 gauge conductor matching what's in the box to the stripped end of black 12 gauge conductor. And once I get it on there, I'm gonna do the tug test and make sure nothing comes free. And now I've got a nicely pigtailed conductor. One thing that's standing in my way is the GFCI device is pretty deep. So I'm gonna remove the clamp that's at the top back of the box here to give myself as much room as possible. The only time I would not be permitted to remove the clamp is when it's securing a wire or there's a vacant hole. See the electrical box itself is in a listed assembly and cannot have any holes to the exterior other than those provided by the manufacturer. Time to carefully tuck my wires into the box and prepare to install the GFCI. Right. Here I've got two name brand GFCI receptacles, Hubble and Leviton. Both are gonna be fantastic. In this case, I'm using my Leviton for two reasons. It's a built-in nightlight GFCI combo, so we're gonna illuminate this, this walkway. It's got a light sensor, so it's only gonna be on when it's dark, but that's gonna keep the kids from stubbing their toes. I've got a shallow metal box, and this Leviton GFCI 
is more shallow than my Hubble GFCI. And older GFCIs are even bulkier and thicker and deeper. So I'm picking up night lights and I'm gonna be able to actually install this in this shallow metal box. Installing a GFCI is pretty easy when you have one set of conductors. Silver corresponds to your white conductor and brass to your black conductor. Line is marked on the back of your GFCI and those are always your incoming conductors. In this case, I only have incoming conductors. If I had outgoing conductors that I was passing through the GFCI, I would install them on this side. Instructions are usually contained in the box. This side is called the load side and protects the outgoing. Slide your conductor underneath the clamp. Secure to manufacturer specified torque, typically about 15 inch pounds. Some electricians and installers would insist on wrapping the GFCI with electrical tape or with an ideal band to protect the terminals from the metal box and shorting out. GFCIs are actually built in with a recess for the terminals such that terminals that are fully tightened down cannot contact the metal box. I'm gonna check the terminals I haven't used and make sure that they're not loose. Now it's time to fold, carefully fold the conductors into the box, which is a bit of a delicate operation in a shallow metal box like this. If you're out of space and you simply can't get it to work, you will be required to replace your electrical box. Now there are a couple things I want to draw your attention to that also make this out GFCI outlet a super outlet. Not only does it have the light sensor, the built-in night light, but it also, see this gold plate here, which is distinct and unique from what's on top and what you find with other GFCIs. That gold plate is a UL listing that allows the ground screw and its connection to a metal box like this when seated flush without any inhibiting properties to continue the grounding path from the box to the GFCI yoke, which is common with the ground terminal screw on the GFCI. Pretty fantastic. However, in this case, we don't have a ground to the box that's functional. So we are using the G N NEC provision 406.4D, which is GFCI in lieu of a ground, which also comes with some basic labeling requirements. The labeling requirements are these, that if any outlets are fed downstream from this outlet, they're required to be marked as GFCI protected. That way, if they fail, somebody will know to come back and push the reset button. In addition, the receptacles are required to be labeled with a no equipment ground label, which comes standard with GFCI outlets. I'm gonna be installing this on my cover since my GFCI is pretty busy and I don't wanna cover anything up on it. However, the label is required to be posted in a place, regardless of whether it's on the GFCI or the cover, that is going to be permanently visible. So no equipment ground and GFCI protected outlet labels are in the packaging. The only thing I noticed about this Leviton receptacle is that it does, didn't come with the cover plate. I actually robbed that out of my Hubble. This type of cover plate with the rectangular cutout is called a Decora if you're shopping online. We're gonna have all of these parts and codes if you need to interact with a local inspector or a home inspector. So we finished up the GFCI, we've installed it, turned on the breaker, and let me tell you a few things about GFCIs. This one, it's got the beautiful night light to help illuminate the traffic area at, at dark. There are, most GFCIs are equipped with an indicator light to indicate proper function. They do a self-test and when they fail, that light will go out or turn red, such as when they're tripped. There's a test and a reset button. In order to re-energize the GFCI, push the reset button. GFCIs trip when there is a differential in current between hot and neutral of four to six milliamps. That's extremely small. However, bear in mind that the human heart can be stopped or put into AFib by as little as 10 milliamps. So this device is sensitive enough to preserve the human heart from harmful shock. In our comments or descriptions, if I left anything out, let me know. Now let's talk real quick about all the locations where GFCI protection is required 
SPY code. GFCIs were introduced to the National Electrical Code in 1971, and the GFCI required protection has been expanding almost every code year since then. GFCI protection was first required in the 1971 National Electrical Code, and every year thereafter, with few exceptions, GFCI requirements have been expanded and increased in the National Electrical Code. If your home was built prior to 2020, it's probably already out of date. For instance, GFCI protections required on all standard 125 and 250 volt receptacles installed in the following locations bathrooms, garages, and accessory buildings that have a floor located at or below grade level, not intended as habitable rooms, and limited to storage areas, work areas, and areas of similar use. Outdoors, crawl spaces at or below grade level, basements, finished and unfinished, kitchens, where the receptacles are installed to serve the countertop surfaces, sinks where the receptacles are installed within six feet from the top inside edge of the bowl of the sink, boat houses, bathtubs or shower stalls where receptacles are installed within six feet of the outside edge of the bathtub or shower stall, laundry areas, indoor damp and wet locations. Now bear in mind, with the National Electrical Code, there are always exceptions and fine print notes. For further information, consult National Electrical Code 210.8. When a tester is plugged into an outlet and it has an open ground, it'll indicate such, and the legend is here to explain what the lights mean. Now, when you push the GFCI test button, nothing's gonna happen because the tester utilizes fault current, just milliamps, from hot to ground. So it can't perform that function because the ground is open. However, the GFCI, even though it won't trip to the test button, is code compliant in light of 406.40 in the National Electrical Code. And you always wanna check that indicator light to see that the GFCI is not faulted. You might be asking, what does it cost for me to hire a professional to do my GFCIs for me? For instance, my home inspection report I'm, I'm selling a home and it's requiring a licensed professional too, and that's typically the case. Well, you can expect to pay for labor and materials anywhere from $47 to $147 to have one GFCI replaced, plus a trip charge. That is complete GFCI protection. We went from this to that. All our tools, all our references will be in the comment section below. If we missed anything, drop it in there and we'll pin your comment to the top. Check out our next video here and subscribe to Electric Pro Academy for real skills to make real money.